Well, welcome everybody to today's INE Live. I am Keith Bogart, um, and apparently you can ask me anything. So if you need my social security number, blood type, or checking account number, anything is fair game. Well, maybe two out of those three. Uh, so I, if, I've been reading the comments here, and uh, like someone said earlier in the comment, if you actually have a, a question you wanna ask me, please just preface that with a Q, so I will know it's a question as opposed to a comment. Um, and then we will go from there. And by the way, this is being recorded. Uh, so if you have to drop off early for some reason, never fear, it will be on our site or on YouTube or something so that you can watch it at a later date. Uh, so for those of you who might not know me, uh, like I said, I'm an instructor here at i &E. I've been at i &E for about seven years. Uh, before that, I worked at Cisco for about 17 or 18 years. Uh, in the technical training department over there. I was also a TAC engineer and a network consulting engineer for Cisco. My specialty here within INE is creating courses on the Cisco CCNA and CCNP uh, certifications. I've also been creating courses for Juniper's JNCIA certification as well. Several of those have already come out. So, uh, you know, that's my specialty. So let's go ahead and the bearded IT dad wants the last nine digits of my social security number. Sure, it's 555-1234-888. I think that's it. Okay, so thank you for that question. Good question, moving on. So I'm gonna scroll up here a little bit and try to tackle some of the, maybe the older questions that came in first. So let's see, what did we have here? So, there was also another question from the bearded IT dad uh, a while ago that asked, is Cisco planning on updating the CCNA anytime in the near future? Great question. Um, first of all, you know, Cisco is super secretive about what they do with their certifications and when they choose to do it. But there are some historical things that we can sort of fall back on. So generally speaking, once a Cisco certification is refreshed, then that means it's good for three to four or four and a half years before they come out with another major update to their certification. So since all of their certifications were totally revamped back in, I think it was February of 2020, that means that we have at least another year before they do a whole revamp. Now, there is a caveat to that though, and I just discovered this the other day. So one question that probably somebody would i would anticipate asking me is to ask about you know what kind of hands-on configuration questions uh might i see on like the ccna or the ccmp or something like that and cisco certifications have several different question types and one of the question types that used to really throw people for a loop and chew up a lot of your time was the simulation questions and those were the type of questions where you'd be presented with a topology diagram they give you some text saying, you know, make this happen, configure this, and they'd actually actually click on devices in the simulation, open up like a, a virtual console session and type in commands and try to meet the objective. Well, I found out just the other day that that question type has been retired. And you might think, oh, woohoo, don't have to worry about that anymore. Well, yes and no. That question type is retired. So if you take you know, the CCNA or CCNP exams right now, I would not expect to see that in there. However, they are coming out with a different type of question, which is first gonna be implemented in the, um, I think it's the CCNP service provider uh, track, which is a, oh man, I always forget the name of this. Hold on a second, I've got it right here and I'll actually tell you what it is. Okay, it's called performance-based exam items. And so basically from what little they share with us, it's very similar to what the simulation questions were, just a, a different user interface, but it's basically the same type of thing from what I can tell, which is a, a topology environment that you can click on and configure things. So why I'm bringing that up is because that's an example of, hey, they've made a major change to how the exam looks and feels, but it's technically not considered a refresh of the exam. So every three or four years, they go up with an exam refresh, which means they might put in totally new topics, totally new subjects, strip out huge portions of the exam that they no longer consider relevant. That's what they do every three or four years. But 
Cisco does have the freedom in that three or four year window to make adjustments to the exam, like in this case, where they're gonna be putting performance-based exam items into it. Now, so far, and this, this announcement about performance-based exam items just came out at the end of March. And like I said, they said initially, we're gonna be putting it in our CCMP service provider exams, but they said expect it to show up in other exams soon. So if you are kind of nervous about the idea of getting hit with an exam question that has actual configuration you have to do, I would say take that exam now because any time in the next month or two, you could see it showing up in the CCNA or the, you know, the CCMP enterprise exam. So long answer to a very short question. Let's see, what else do we have on here? Okay, so here's a question from, please forgive me if I'm mispronouncing your name, uh, Gwetafi Muhammad Ali, who says, do we need just the CCNA to be a network admin or should we go further and take the CCNP exam? That's another great question. I hear that a lot. A lot of that depends on your geography. Um, so I was reading the other day uh, in Reddit, because somebody had asked this same type of question, uh, some answers were, well, you know, in, in our city, you know, we have a, a ton of people with CCNAs. So people who are getting hired as network admins either have a CCNA and some considerable experience that they can demonstrate, or they have a CCNP. Another person chimed in and said, well, in our city, I, I got hired as a network admin. All I had was a CCNA. So I think it really depends on where you're located geographically and what the needs are within your community. I will tell you this, um, if you have it in you, if you have the time and money to pursue the CCNP after the CCNA, absolutely do that. Um, think of the number of people with certifications as being like a pyramid. You know, at the bottom of the pyramid, the widest part, you've got a ton of CCNAs, lots of people with CCNAs, even high school students with CCNAs who've gone through like the Network Academy program. Then you go up the pyramid and you've got far less people with CCNPs. And at the very top, you've got the CCIEs, which is far, far less. So the higher you get up that pyramid, the greater your chances are of landing some sort of a job. So, I would definitely recommend that after you get your CCNA, you pursue your CCNP. Another reason for that is because the CCNA prior to 2020, when they made all those changes, used to have a lot of questions based on configuration. Not necessarily just, you know, get into a topology and configure something, but like multiple choice questions saying, which of the following answers is the correct command to make this happen? And but then in 2020, they sort of switched it to where there's far less configuration related stuff and a lot more theory. So if I was an employer, what that would tell me is that someone with a CCNA who got their CCNA from 2020 onwards doesn't have the knowledge of configuration necessarily that someone who got an older CCNA had. And so I'd be thinking, okay, well, just because someone has a CCNA, you know, I know what that test is. I've taken it or one of my employees have taken it. I know they got some pretty good theory across a really broad range of topics, but I don't know if I can trust their configuration knowledge. So that's another reason why I would definitely recommend you add the CCNP on top of your CCNA if you really wanna get that edge when you're interviewing. All right, so what other questions we have? So Bob Bob asks, is the CCNA still relevant in the networking arena since it's only Cisco focused? Okay. Well, so first of all, Cisco is still the predominant player in the networking realm, right? When you take a look at, if you ever stumble across like any pie charts or anything about who has sold the last, the greatest quantity of switches in the last year or routers in the last year, Cisco always has the lion's share of that stuff. So as far as networking vendors go, if you go to work for anybody, chances are still really, really good that who you go to work for will either be an all Cisco shop or a mostly Cisco shop. 
Um, that's not always true. You know, in some smaller office environments, they might have, you know, no Cisco stuff. But for anything that's midsize on up, very likely that they'll have uh, a good portion of their gear as being Cisco. So certainly the CCNA and the CCNP will give you the, the knowledge you need of configuration commands to jump on those things and start configuring access lists, you know, routing protocols, whatever. But even above and beyond that, let's say that you were going to work apply for a job at a company that didn't have any Cisco, they didn't have any Juniper. As a matter of fact, the routers and switches and stuff and you know access points that they had were some vendor that you'd never heard of before. So you might be thinking, well, then my CC is useless because all those configuration commands I learned are down the drain. Well, yes, the configuration portion of it might not be as relevant, but like I said, the CCA now is heavily weighted on theory rather than actual implementation and configuration. And that theory they ask you about, a lot of that stuff is relevant no matter what vendor you're talking about. So, you know, the, the theoretical questions you'll get on Wi-Fi, for example, every company out there has Wi-Fi these days. So you gotta know Wi-Fi at the theoretical level before you jump onto an access point or something and configure it. You know, every vendor out there has switches and all switches implement spanning tree and VLANs and that's stuff that's gonna be in the CCNA as well. So probably a good 85 to 90% of the theory stuff you'll get in the CCNA is still relevant no matter what vendor you're dealing with. So I would definitely still say it's relevant. Plus, you know, when you look at, at job postings, you know, for example, if you haven't done this recently, you know, go on indeed.com or something and look at recent postings for network engineers. And I bet you'll see that at least 75% of them have CCNA as a requirement or like a, a preferred requirement. So yes, I would definitely say it's still definitely useful. All right, so what else do we have here? Okay, uh, so the bearded IT dad asked a question. What is the best, what's best for building a home lab or virtualizing using Packet Tracer? Okay, so I would say neither <laughs> because, and uh, this is actually where I would like to share something with you. So I'd like to share my screen. Okay, so once my screen comes up, there we go. So I always recommend this environment here because it's absolutely free, it doesn't cost you anything. Um, like Packet Tracer, Packet Tracer is absolutely free, but what I'm gonna show you here is Cisco's DevNet environment. And you don't have to purchase anything from Cisco, all you gotta do is register for this, which is, just means giving them your, you know, your uh, whatever username and ID you wanna use, your email address, your name, and that's about it. No credit card involved. So once you sign up for this, you can go into where it says sandbox catalog. And what these are, are all sorts of sandbox labs. And when we say sandbox lab, that means it's a lab that you could completely screw up, completely mess up your devices and it wouldn't hurt anything. It's self-contained, not connected to the internet, not connected to any production environment. That's why we call it a sandbox lab. You can just play around with it. So these are a whole bunch of sandbox labs here that you could play around with. But what I really wanna focus your attention on, if I scroll down here, are the Cisco Modeling Labs and Cisco Modeling Labs Enterprise. So for example, the Cisco Modeling Labs Enterprise, you can reserve that for up to two days. So you know, I could click on here and reserve it for two days. And then once you click reserve, just wait like five, 10 minutes, an email will be sent to you with VPN credentials, and then you can log into it. And what this is, is once you reserve it, you're basically given a Cisco Modeling Labs platform to play around with. So if you're not familiar with Cisco Modeling Labs, it's kind of like Packet Tracer in that you have you know, virtualized routers and switches and other stuff like that. And like Packet Tracer, you can build your own topologies, drag in a router, drag in another router, put a link between them so they can talk to each other. You know, that's similar. But what's different is that Packet Tracer is not using real Cisco iOS software, the software found on their routers and switches. Packet Tracer is sort of uh, simulated software. Someone wrote some code to make it look and feel like Cisco iOS, but it's not real Cisco iOS. You might be wondering, well, 
Why do I care? What's the difference? Here's why you care. Because number one, uh, there might be some features you want to test out that are available in Cisco Modeling Labs because Cisco Modeling Labs does use real Cisco iOS software, but that feature might not be available in Packet Tracer. Um, or maybe you're playing around with a feature and there's a certain thing that feature is supposed to be able to do that's not available in Packet Tracer, but is available here. So you'll have availability of, of any feature that's in Cisco iOS software here in Cisco Modeling Labs, but it may not be available in Packet Tracer. Another difference. You know, one of the things you, you want to get used to when you're configuring stuff is the various show commands to monitor and verify what you've just done. And I've noticed that in Packet Tracer, sometimes the, the formatting and the output of various show commands isn't really what you'd see on a Cisco router or switch. It's a little bit different. Um, it might be lacking certain lines of information. So to get the more real authentic experience, I would say don't use Packet Tracer use this uh, because this is you know like i said real ios routers and switches now when you when you reserve one of these labs here like cisco modeling labs initially when you get access to it it'll have a predefined lab in it with you know certain routers and stuff in there but you don't have to use that as a matter of fact once you've got your access to your cisco modeling labs you could just turn off that lab and turn and start a whole brand new one from scratch by dragging and dropping the routers and switches that you want to use and so, you know, all you need is internet connectivity to access this, you know, and register on their site. So I would recommend this over Cisco Modeling Labs, I mean, over um, Packet Tracer any day of the week. I would definitely recommend this. All right, so I don't need to share that anymore. Let's see here. What other questions do we have? Oh, also, as far as building your own home-based lab, that was the other element of that question. So, Definitely, you know, if you were to get a job as a network administrator, you know, wouldn't it be just great if everything you had to do was just to log on to an existing router or switch, jump into the command line and start configuring it, start changing it, right? But in reality, sometimes a job involves getting your hands dirty with some physical stuff, physical cabling, um, software upgrades, password recovery. Um, becoming familiar with the various LEDs on the front so you can know what a blinking orange versus a blinking green versus a blinking red. What does that mean and why am I seeing it? Can't get that experience using Cisco Modeling Labs or Packet Tracer for that. You really do need to have some physical gear. Um, however, physical gear is not cheap, right? I mean, even if you buy used routers and switches on eBay, you're, you're still looking at shelling out a pretty penny. So in an ideal world, I would say that the best lab environment is where 95% of what you do is online using like Cisco modeling labs or something. And the remaining 5% would be a home-based lab. In a home-based lab, you could just have a router and a switch. Just buy a router and a switch, that's it. And that way you can have practice connecting them together with cabling. You can have practice with uh, disaster recovery of you know losing your password, software upgrade and downgrade. You know, becoming familiar with what the interfaces look like, you know, what kind of pins are in there, what LEDs are on the front. Uh, but I don't think you need to build a home lab any bigger than that because, you know, Cisco Modeling Labs will cover, like I said, 95% of what you need. Okay. Let's see what other questions. Okay. So, Alreza. Modifat asks a question, nowadays, should we focus more on GCP, AWS, or Azure cloud certificates rather than CCNP? Well, that also depends on what your focus is on getting a job. So, you know, there's, there are some companies, like smaller companies, a lot of times when you get a job, as a sysadmin or network engineer within a smaller company, you will be expected to do both networking stuff, you know, monitor the access points, um, troubleshoot why switch connections aren't working, maybe swap out an old router for a new one, that stuff. And then you'll also be tasked with doing cloud-based stuff, like, you know, setting up a, a new account in Azure, AWS, 
you know, setting up some new VMs or, or instances and setting up some virtual gateways and stuff in there, you know, implementing BGP between your cloud instance back to your, um, your onsite location so you can do a VPN tunnel. So in some smaller environments, yeah, you got to know both. But even in that situation, you're going to have to know the networking side of stuff just as well as the cloud-based side of stuff. So the CCNA will come in handy there. In a lot of larger organizations that have maybe, you know, dozens or hundreds of routers and switches across a campus, a university, maybe um, a federal building, or just a really large enterprise, most of the time what they will do is they will differentiate their networking people from their, what I'll call their server people. So their networking people won't deal with Azure and AWS and all that stuff. The extent that they might have to deal with that is, you know, somebody from the server side might say, hey, I've just gone into AWS. I've set up some virtual machines. They're all primed and ready to connect via a VPN back to our site here. But I need you to get on the, the external facing router and configure the VPN endpoint on that router to connect to AWS. So that's really your only where you would touch the cloud is on that external router to do that. So like I said, it, it depends on the type of companies you're going to apply for. Um, and, you know, the job descriptions that say whether or not they want both cloud experience and networking experience or just one or the other. So having that cloud knowledge is very useful. So, you know, just depends on what you're going to go looking for. All right, what other questions do we have here? Let's see. All right, I don't see any other questions so far. Okay, well, here's a here's a question that just came in from Surendra. Anything we can do to practice DNA Center? Uh, in their CCIE EI seminar, Cisco said they were working on some virtualized environment for DNA Center, maybe cloud bases or so. No updates so far. Any suggestions? That's a great question. Um, the only... Now, there may be other things I'm not aware of, so I will give you that caveat there. But the only, if, if I was going to practice the basics of DNA Center, I would go right back into using that, uh, that sandbox. Or, let's see here. I might have something else. Just give me a moment. I know that there were some uh, software-based DNA centers that you could play around with a while ago. Uh, anyway, while I'm looking for that, I would def I would just say to use a sandbox environment. I don't have that tab up. I was not expecting a DNA center question. By knowing that DevNet environment, as I'm just looking through it right now, I believe they had some DNA center. Yeah. So let's see, is this being shared right now? Well, let me go ahead and share this screen with you. It's the same screen we were looking at before. Okay. So here's, here's our sandbox environment once again, and you can see they've got, five different uh, DNA center sandbox areas that you can go into and play around with. So I would start with this and play around with, with these. I played around with one of these a while ago. And one thing that was kind of confusing to me and a little frustrating was that I wasn't able to add new nodes that DNA center could interface with. And some of the nodes that it said were in there it wouldn't connect to those nodes. Maybe they fixed that problem since then, but you could start with this. So here's some DNA center stuff you could do. And certainly as far as the CCNA is concerned, you don't have to do any of this stuff. Just reading some of the, the papers on DNA center, what it does, uh, the benefits of DNA center is all you need to pass your CCNA questions. You're not gonna get any CCNA questions that give you screenshots of this and ask you, what button would you press to make this happen? You're not gonna get anything like that. So I wouldn't be concerned with that. Okay, so that answers that question. And let's see what else we have.
Okay, so the bearded IT dad asks a question. For someone just entering the IT field, would the CCNA be a good first certification if they wanted to do networking? Or should they still get an A plus and build some help desk experience for someone just entering the IT field? Hmm. Well, that once again depends on what type of company you go to work for. So like I was mentioning earlier, if you went to a, a, a smaller company that has like 100 employees or less, that's all within like one building, there's a very good chance that their network will be fairly stable. They won't be doing a lot of ads or changes to it. You know, that type of company is not the type to jump on the latest bandwagon of the latest feature, the latest thing that comes out. So usually for a company like that, the extent of the networking is just monitoring it um, and making sure it's healthy. Or if someone, you know, maybe troubleshooting some Wi-Fi sometimes and Yes, that type of environment, they probably would want you to have some PC help desk experience so that you could troubleshoot, you know, Mac OS or Windows problems connecting to the network, um, stuff like that. So an A plus would help you with that type of stuff. But I'm assuming you're watching me right now because your primary interest is in configuring, troubleshooting, monitoring networks. And so you probably won't be gravitating towards jobs that in the job description mentions a lot of stuff about troubleshooting PCs and laptops. So as far as an entry level certification, I still think CCNA is, is the best. And CCNA assumes pretty much nothing. It starts at the, at the ground level. So it's not like you have to do A plus first or networking plus certification from CompTIA and then go to CCNA, you can, you know, be working as a waitress in a restaurant right now, or as a, you know, a bus boy or something and start studying for your CCNA because it literally starts from the bit and byte level and works its way up from there. So I would probably recommend that you go with the CCNA first and just go from right there. Start with that. And bearded IT dad, you are absolutely not asking too many questions. So feel free. I just throw them at me. What other questions does anyone have? So I did gather some, while you guys are thinking about that, I did get, gather some facts about the CCNA that you may or may not be aware of. So let me just throw those at you so you know what you're getting into. So as far as any certification exam is concerned, once you pass a certification exam like CCNA, CCNP, you can't take it again for 180 days. Now, you might be asking, well, why would I want to? Hey, there are some people out there that have various reasons for doing that, but just be aware that that's one of the restrictions. Got to wait six months until you can take the exam again after you pass it. Now, if you fail an exam, you can't retake the same exam for five days. So it's not like you can sign up the very next day and go take it five business days. Actually, they say five calendar days, although, you know, good luck getting it on a Saturday or Sunday. Five days later, you can go take it. You can take as many times as you want if you fail it. Like you could literally fail it eight times going every five days and then pass it on the ninth time. There's no, you know, maximum quantity of attempts. Be aware that the CCNA is a $300 exam. So that's how much it costs you. So if you fail it five times, you're gonna be paying $300 every time to reschedule it. Another common question is, well, what if I've scheduled it, you know, gave him my credit card, paid for it, and I either have to change the date or I have to cancel it. Is that money lost? As long as you go onto the Pearson View website, because Pearson View is a testing proctor that Cisco has selected for doing these exams, as long as you log into the Pearson View website and either change or cancel your testing date within 24 hours, you're okay. You won't lose your money. But if you need to change or cancel something after, you know, after 24 hours, then it's gone. So be aware of that. Uh, the CCNA, they give you a total of 120 minutes to take the exam. 
Now, when you go on a Pearson Views website and you register for the CCNA, it'll actually say 140 minutes, but 20 of those minutes are for test preparation, where like you can read through, hey, what's your confidentiality agreement? They might give you some sample questions so you can see what the format is like. Uh, type in some demographics about yourself. So technically, once you actually start the exam on their computer, it's, a, it's two hours that you have, 120 minutes. And it's gonna be anywhere from 100 to 120 questions within those two hours. So you probably will go right up to the last minute there when taking it. So that may have answered some questions you didn't know that you had. Okay, so let's see here. Uh, Bearded IT Dad says, what do you think about the Cisco Meraki line of certifications? Unfortunately, I can't speak to that because I don't, I'm not familiar with uh, the Meraki stuff or the Meraki certification. So can't help you with that one. Let's see. Cisco loves your money. Yes, they do. They do love your money. Uh, let's see here. Okay, uh, so Badro asks a question at the bottom, the most recent question here. He says, hi, Keith, big fan here. Please give some advice for people that want to go for Encore, but are not currently working in a pure networking role. Okay, so for those of you who are not familiar with Encore, you know, what's he talking about there? So at the CCNP level, CCNP exams require that you pass uh, two exams. They have a core exam and then a concentration exam. And every CCNP, whether it be the enterprise CCNP, the service provider, the data center CCNP, they have a core. So Encore is for the enterprise core exam for CCNP, you gotta pass that one. And then they have about five or six specialized exams, what they call concentration exams, and you can pick one of those. So maybe your interest is in wireless. They have a concentration exam for wireless. Maybe you wanna get deeper into routing. They have a concentration exam for that. But you gotta pass the, the core exam before you do any of the others. Now, the, the order is not important. You can, If you wanted to, you could sign up and take and pass one of the concentration exams first and then go back and later take the core exam. But you gotta get two of them under your belt to get your official CCNP. Now, the, the enterprise core, the Encore exam, is what actually used to be the CCIE routing and switching written exam. So, you know, before 2020, there was a clear differentiation between CCNP and CCIE. With CCNP, there was like three exams you had to pass, route, switch, and T-shoot, and then you got your CCNP. And then if you wanted to go on to CCIE, you had to take a CCIE routing and switching written exam, and once you passed that, you would take their lab exam. Then in 2020, when everything got changed, they said, okay, here's what we're gonna do. The core exam, like enterprise core, will serve two purposes. For people who wanna get a CCNP, they'll take that and a concentration exam, and now they're done. They got their CCNP. For people who wanna go for the enterprise CCIE, they'll just pass the core exam, the enterprise core, and then they'll take the lab exam. So that's why I say the enterprise core exam is basically what used to be routing and switching. And that kind of blows my mind <laughs> because you know, back in the day, CCNP before 2020, CCNP was hard enough. It had a, a lot of topics in there between route, switch, and T-shoot that you had to pass. And it was always kind of well known that, you know, here's the knowledge you needed to pass your CCNP and then here was the knowledge you needed to pass your CCIE written exam. But now all that stuff that was in the CCIE written exam is now in the Encore exam, which is pretty hard. I mean, the if you think the, the scope of the CCNA is huge, wait till you, till you see the scope of the Encore exam. It's massive. Um, so how do you prepare for something like that? that that's a really good question. Um, well, definitely need to have self-discipline for any of these exams, uh, Encore or anything else. You, you wanna make sure that you develop a habit of devoting a minimum 
of an hour and a half a day to studying and lab practice, and then probably three or four hours a day on the weekends for studying and lab practice. You just got to get used to doing that. So that's number one. Number two, and you'll see this recommended by everybody out there in the sun, flashcards, 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 make flashcards as you're reading through books, as you're watching videos, you know, giving yourself questions on one side of the flashcard and answers on the other. So a lot of people use uh, web-based flashcards. For example, there's Anki, there's Quizlet. I personally prefer Quizlet because they have sort of a gamification feel that you can also do. Um, but you're going to want to make flashcards and review those flashcards a lot. Uh, review the flashcards. One thing I like about um, actual creating flashcards on like a four by six or a three by five note card is that, you know, it's been scientifically proven that the more you involve your physical senses in something, the quicker you'll learn something. So if you can sort of creatively think about, you know, how can I incorporate as many of my senses, you know, touch, seeing, smelling, whatever, into this process, that will make you learn it quicker. And I think that by, you know, taking a pen and writing out your question on the flashcard, flipping it over, writing it out, that I think reinforces it a little bit more than a computer-based flashcard. Um, but, you know, it's completely up to you how you do that. But yeah, definitely do flashcards, review those every day. Every day, take at least 15 minutes of studying time, reviewing flashcards and lab constantly. If you're doing an hour and a half of studying every single day, at least 30 minutes of that time should be jumping into a lab environment like I showed you, Cisco Modeling Labs or something else, and practicing what you learned. And don't just practice what you most recently learned. You know, like let, let's say I'm three months into studying and right now what I'm learning about is OSPF. Well, yeah, you want to practice OSPF. You want to, you know, practice debugging it, uh, looking at the output, intentionally break it. You say, well, well, the book says if I do this and this, it should work. Well, what if I do something else? You know, it won't work. Well, let me see. If it doesn't work, what do I see? Do I see messages on the screen? Do I have to turn on a debug to actually show me what's broken? So that's also a really good learning experience is intentionally breaking things to see what the result is. But like I said, if you're three months into it, and let's say I'm studying OSPF, I should also incorporate into my lab stuff I studied two and three months ago. You know, maybe when I very first started out, I started out learning about IP addressing. Well, you know, when I create a lab environment, I should, you know, write on there, okay, this link is supporting five hosts. This link is supporting 12 hosts. This link is supporting 15 hosts. And then just come up with the top of my head, okay, I'm going to subnet the 1010 slash 16 network and then practice your variable link subnet masking as part of your lab. So it really just boils down to that constant repetition, repetition of going through all those topics over and over again. Also, um, if you can get involved in some sort of an online study group, that could be useful. And I don't know if any of these exist. I know there are online study groups, but in, in my mind, if I was going to join an online study group, I would want to be interactive. In other words, I would want to have the ability to create questions for other people and have them create questions for me so we could test each other. Um, another great way of learning is presenting, right? A as a teacher, you will learn far more than as a student. So I think a great online study group might be something that's you know limited in scope that says, okay, we're going to accept you know 30 people to the study group. And that says, okay, um, Bob, on... April 12th, it's going to be your turn to present something to us. So prepare a 20-minute presentation over Zoom. On April 15th, Sally, you do a 20-minute presentation. And having that stress of having to create a presentation will also help you. Now, if you can't find a study group like that, create YouTube videos. You know, create your own YouTube channel and start creating YouTube videos on the stuff that you're learning, where you show other people how it works, where you go into a lab environment and you say, here's how you configure this stuff. That will also burn it into your brain very, very well. So those are the recommendations I have for Encore or anything else. All right. So what else do we have here? Let's see. 
Somebody asks, how long does a CCNA take to study? Well, that is uh, very subjective. Um, it depends on your existing knowledge base. Like if you've already been working as a network admin for you know several months or, or a year, clearly it's going to take you less time to study for it than someone who has no networking experience whatsoever. Uh, it also depends on how much time you have to devote to it. I've heard of some people who were you know unemployed and they took their time of being unemployed to just dive headfirst into studying for the CCNA. They just did that for hours and hours every day, and they actually were able to do it in 30 days. That is rare, I think. And honestly, if someone was able to pass the exam with 30 days of studying, I would seriously question how much do they actually know? You know, if I sat them down in front of a network and I asked them to configure some of the stuff on the CCNA, would they be able to do it? Hmm, I don't know. Uh, I, I think a general good guideline is prepare a minimum of 90 days for studying. And that'll be really good if you can pass it after 90 days. Um, most people, I think it takes them probably six to nine months. If they're starting at like ground zero and they know nothing or almost nothing about networking, it takes them a good six to nine months to pass their CCNA. And that's doing like what I talked about, an hour and a half on weekdays, three or four hours on weekends, lots of labs. So that's a, a general rule of thumb. All right, so what else? How do you prepare for CCNA? Um, so let me share something with you here on my screen. Let's see. CCNA. This is not it. All right. Well, we'll just do it the old fashioned way. So I would go to Google and uh, Google, just type in Cisco CCNA exam topics. So this is your starting point right here. So click on this first link, exam topics from the Cisco Learning Network. And this shows you that the CCNA is broken down into about six high level categories. And if you click on these arrows here, it shows you more details about the category and what they expect you to learn within that category. So I would definitely start with that. You know, expand each one of those bullet points or each one of those categories and print it off somewhere so you have it in front of you. And then um, I always recommend that you use Cisco's official certification guide. They actually have two certification guidebooks to cover the CCNA, like a volume one and a volume two. They're both pretty thick. So they're both like well over 500 pages each. That's why I say it'll take you about six to nine months because that's a lot of reading you'll have to do. But, you know, I would go to Amazon and search up uh, Cisco 200-301 official certification guide and you'll find the two books in there. And then as you read through those books, they should cover everything in these topics right here. You know, somebody sometimes asks me, well, you know, do I need to study X, Y, and Z to pass my certification? X, Y, and Z being some feature or protocol. Do I need to study that? Do I need to learn that? And my general rule of thumb is that if something is in the official certification guide, then yes, you need to study it. Sometimes people also ask me, they say, well, you know, I know that, for example, if I go here for um, IP connectivity, they'll say, it says here, configure and verify single area OSPF V2. And as they start reading about OSPF, they, they realize, wow, OSPF is a really deep topic. I mean, you could go real far with that. It's a pretty complicated protocol. And so they'll ask me, they'll say, how much of this or something else do I actually need to know to pass my CCNA or to pass my CCNP. And my answer once again is whatever level of depth they go into in the official certification guide is most likely the level of depth they'll expect from you when you take the test. So for example, notice how it says here, configure and verify single area OSPF V2. I would not expect the certification guidebook to talk about multi-area OSPF V2. I would not expect it to talk about virtual links because you need more than one area to have a virtual link. 
So if you are studying and you run across those topics, you say, oh, well, I just found a page on OSPF virtual links. Oh, is that in the CCNA? Well, it's probably not in the official certification guide. And if it's not in there, you don't have to worry about it. Now, one thing I will also warn you about, and this is not just on the CCNA, this is for other Cisco certs as well. You might very well come across one or more test questions that don't show up in this exam blueprint at all. You might say, whoa, what's this? You know, I'm getting this whole protocol I'm getting questions about, and it's not even in the blueprint right here. So nobody knows, even the vast majority of people at Cisco don't know how these exams are scored. Um, what When you sit down for an exam, though, one thing that they will tell you when you're prepping for the exam on their computer or anything, they will say you may be given um, questions. I don't remember exactly how they word it, but you may be given questions which are not graded. Um, and I think Cisco does that because for a variety of reasons, they they might want to know, hey, you know, we, we don't think that this protocol is necessarily really relevant to CCNA, but maybe we want to see if people are familiar with it anyway, or Maybe we, we thought about putting this in the CCNA, but we decided against it. We weren't really quite sure, but we'll ask them some questions on it anyway. It won't affect their grade just to see if it's something people know. Personally, I think it's completely unfair that you would spend all this time studying stuff and then be hit with questions that's not even in the topics list at all. I, I don't agree with that. And the other thing is, when you get those questions, you don't know. <laughs> you don't know if they're graded or not. They look like any other question. So all you know is, hey, I'm being hit with a question that was nowhere in the certification guide, nowhere in the topics list here, and yet I'm being asked that. So it's unfortunate that Cisco does that, but if you run across that, and chances are you will, if not in the CCNA the first time, then the second time or third time you take it, I would just say, don't stress, just do your best with the question and, and move on. If you know the topics in the topics list, like we see here, if you know those topics really, really well, even if you get those three or four questions wrong on topics that just hit you out of the blue, it should not cause you to fail, okay? But I do want you to be aware of that. So use the official certification guide. Clearly, you know, we here at INE have a ton of videos on the CCNA. Um, and CCNP. So as you're watching the videos, pause them frequently and make quiz questions for yourself. Write down on a piece of paper lab ideas that come to your head, you know, as you watch a video. Oh, I'd like to try that. Oh, Keith just said that, you know, these two routers need to exchange uh, their subnet mass uh, in order for it to work. Well, wh what happens if I configure my routers not to do that? You know, write that down. Um, so that's that's how you would approach that. And then lab it up a lot. Okay, so I don't think I need to show anything else there. All right, so what else, what other questions do we have here? Okay, so somebody asked, we've got a few minutes left here. Uh, somebody asked, how do you make IPv6 easy? <laughs> um, how do you make it easy? Well, the first thing is, you know, IPv6 at a real high level can be broke up in sort of like two categories. You have IPv6 addressing and understanding how IPv6 addresses are different than IPv4, how they're constructed, looking at them and being able to recognize, oh, this is a special type of address. Oh, this is another special type of address. So there's everything involved with addressing. And the other part of it is IPv6 services like routing protocols that use IPv6, access lists that use IPv6, first hop redundancy that uses IPv6. So those are all things that use IPv6. Generally speaking, once you have, if you've got a good knowledge of IPv4 and the services that use IPv4, for example, if you know OSPF as a routing protocol pretty well for IPv4, then the vast majority of what you know for that IPv4 protocol will translate to that same protocol when it's used for IPv6. There may be some differences, but the underlying mechanics of how the protocol works most of the time won't really change, whether it's using V4 or V6. 
So if you get to understand the addressing structure, how those addresses are given, recognizing what addresses are special and mean certain special things, then after that, the rest of IPv6 becomes fairly easy because most of it is very similar to how something works in the world of IPv4. And as far as the addresses are concerned, just learn to visualize things in binary. Like whenever I think about an address, whether it's an IPv4 address or an IPv6 address, I imagine just a long string of ones and zeros because that's all an address really is, right? Uh, when That's how your computer looks at its IPv4, IPv6 address. It's a long string of ones and zeros. And so how it's represented though is different in V4 and V6. And that's what you have to, what, that's what you have to learn. All right, let's do uh, another three or four questions and then we'll wrap it up here because it will have been an hour at that point. What else do we have? I'm not familiar with Cisco CyberOps or EJPT certification, so unfortunately I can't speak to that. Somebody, so Jonathan Smith asked the question, would you suggest the CCNP enterprise before security. So I assume you're asking, would you suggest CCNP enterprise before taking CCNP security? Absolutely, I would suggest that. Um, because the, the CCNP security has a lot of concepts that dovetail or ride on top of the CCNP enterprise. You know, if, if you're going to be implementing network-based security, and what I mean by that is uh, you're going to be implementing things to secure your routers and switches to make sure that people can't um, log on to them that are unauthorized, to make sure that people can't um, mess with your routing protocols and cause your routing protocols to you know, do things they're not supposed to do. So you have to understand the basic mechanics of the enterprise stuff. You have to understand how the routing protocol works, how passwords are used in Cisco routers and switches. Um, how DHCP functions, all of that baseline stuff is covered in the CCNP enterprise. Now, what I will say though, is that if your real desire is to go into security, yes, you should study for the CCNP enterprise, but you don't necessarily have to take the exams. Don't stress yourself out over, oh man, I gotta take the Encore exam and something else. And then after I totally blow my mind with those, then I gotta go into security. No, don't do that. Just learn it. Read the books on CCNP Enterprise, practice them in the labs, get really comfortable with the concepts, and then don't take any of those exams. Then move over to your CCNP security and start preparing for those exams, which are what really interests you in the first place. But yes, I would definitely recommend to anybody in their networking career, whether they want to really specialize in wireless, data center, um, you know, service provider, security. I always tell people, start with the CCNA, then go to your CCNP enterprise. You want to get those things out of the way before you branch off into your specialties. So that's my personal opinion on that. Is it what so uh Daib asks, is it worth chasing the CCIE enterprise with view in the field? So if I'm understanding your question correctly, Daib, I think what you're asking is as far as job prospects, as far as what people expect network engineers to actually do and get hired, is it worth pursuing the CCIE enterprise? That is still a very popular in-demand certification. Absolutely. Um, if you have your CCIE enterprise, you shouldn't have any problem getting a job. Now, once again, though, if your ultimate personal pursuit is something else like data center or security or whatever, I would not recommend you go for the CCIE enterprise. I'd recommend CCNA, CCNP, you know, get your CCNA cert, study for CCNP enterprise, but don't take the certifications and then branch off. And then maybe eventually you'll get up to CCIE security, which is your real passion, or maybe CCIE wireless, which is your real passion. Um, but if the enterprise stuff is what you really want to work on. You're really interested in the routers, the switches, uh, the routing protocols, all that stuff. Then yes, going up to CCIE enterprise, is still a very, very valuable certification to have. 
All right, I think I'll answer one more question and then I think we will be at the end of our time here. Let's just see. Okay, so here's a great question from Super Gabby Bear. <laughs> I love your name, Super Gabby Bear. Um, I got stuck on a different IT job, which doesn't handle routing and switching. I'm sorry to hear that. I got rusty. What is your advice or recommendation for people who want to go back to routing and switching? Okay, well, so the good thing about Cisco certifications is that one is not dependent upon the other. What I mean by that is, for example, if you wanted to, you could go straight for the CCIE, never take the CCNA certification, never take a CCNP concentration exam, just go straight to a CCNP core exam, followed by the, the CCIE lab exam that goes with that. You could do that. Um, so they, they're not, one does not require another as a prerequisite. So, if at one point in time, you felt that you knew routing and switching fairly well, like you're describing here, and then you were moved off that into something else, like dealing with VMware or something for like the last six to nine months, you sort of lost some of that stuff. I would say, go back to the CCNA books or our videos, watch our videos, read the books, but you know, don't pressure yourself with, oh, now I gotta take the CCNA all over again. Um, well, here's the other thing. Um, if you wanna go back to routing and switching, the question would be, is it your intent to stay in your same company and go back to routing and switching? Or is it your intent to start looking for other jobs that deal with routing and switching? If you're gonna stay in your own company, you're hoping, okay, I'd like to do a refresh on routing and switching and maybe in six months, I'll hit up my boss and say, hey boss, I'd like to go back to the network team over there. Can I do that? Then you probably don't need a certification under your belt to do that, but you do need the knowledge. So I would definitely recommend watching our videos, reading the official certification guidebooks, labbing stuff up to, to refresh your memory of all that stuff that you lost. But if you plan on leaving your company, leaving your job and applying for some totally different job at a totally different company, they you're, will expect you to have a certification under your belt. So you know it probably won't be enough to say, well, yeah, you know, back in uh, 1997, I had a CCIE and routing and switching, but I've been doing, you know, VMware and AWS cloud stuff for the past two years, but I, I'd like to work for you as a network engineer. They're probably gonna say, it's been too long. Uh, we need to see a more recent cert under your belt. So in that case, um, if you used to know it really well, you're kind of rusty, then I would say, read the CCNA stuff, skip through it, skim through it, read through it, and then go directly for your CCNP and try to get the CCNP actual certification, both the core and the concentration exams under your belt. And then you'll be well primed to apply to some network engineering role at some other company. All right, folks, that covers it for today. Thank you so much for all of your questions. Uh, I really appreciate your engagement. Hopefully some of the things I said uh, gave you some insights some different ways of thinking. And I really appreciate your time today. So thanks for watching us for INE Live and look out for our next session.